With all the festivities, extra songs, reading, and kids in here today, uh, we're going to try to make this a little bit shorter than, than usual. Uh, there's a house on our street that put up a nativity scene on their uh, lawn that whenever I drive past it, I just love looking at it because you just don't see a whole lot of nativity scenes anymore, right? You used to see them a lot more in the past. That's okay. But every time I pass it, I just love it. It's so peaceful. I mean, you just see Mary with this understated but huge expression of joy. It's kind of like a Mona Lisa plus smile, you know, as she just takes in her surroundings and all that's happening. Of course, there's Joseph around her. There's the Magi. There's shepherds. Uh, and, of course, she's just locked in on baby Jesus. And you could just tell she's just filled with joy. Every time I drive past it, every time, I'm just drawn in. And I just find that I have a smile on my face. You know, it's just one of those scenes. But I was thinking about it this week in my study, and I was, I was struck with the idea that that picturesque scene of a nativity that we put onto our lawns probably didn't exist that first Christmas. At least not for very long. I mean, I kind of think about it, think of it this way. It's, it's, that, the nativity scenes that we put on our lawn are more akin to capturing the feel of that first Christmas than, say, a, a photo, shoot to re, photo shoot to represent our family Christmas. You know what I mean? It's like when you try to take a photo shoot at Christmas, it is like pulling teeth. It's really hard, and there is chaos frontwards and backwards. You know, it's like chaos emotionally, chaos logistically. It's just chaos, chaos, chaos. Say cheese. Chaos, chaos, chaos. I mean, that's just, that's just Christmas. I actually feel like that represents the true nativity, if you will, far better than sometimes we see on our lawns. The first Christmas was chaos. The first Christmas was scary. It was messy, and it was completely and utterly enveloped in brokenness. And that's actually why the meaning of the true Christmas is so wonderful. That last text that was just read is our text today, and it's one that's often not highlighted this time of year. Uh, one of our traditions as a family is before we open up presents on Christmas Day is we'll go around, we'll let the kids read the Christmas story. We usually read from Luke chapter 2. Parents, if you're interested in a tradition, put in a little spiritual marker down before you get to all the presents and all that. Uh, you could read Luke 2. It's a wonderful thing to do. But we don't read this part of the story, <laughs> and that's okay. But the story that was just read shows that the baby Jesus was born into harsh brokenness. Harsh brokenness. The angel of the Lord came to Joseph, Jesus' dad, and said in verse 13, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt, meaning leave Bethlehem, leave Israel, go to a foreign land, stay there until I tell you, he went on to say, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. In other words, Jesus was born a refugee, fleeing for his life. And the angel's words would pr prove true in that the ancient king Herod would go on to try to use any means necessary to kill the baby Jesus, including uh, making a decree where any child, any baby boy, two years and younger, would be put to death. I mean, that, those are scary times. Jesus was, was born a refugee. Jesus was, was born fleeing genocide. Now, there's a lot of crazy, scary, chaos, broken things happening in our world today. You just read about in your news. But of all those things, it's like, man, what Jesus was born into would be way up there at the top of any of those lists. Jesus was born into, into harsh brokenness. And lest we be tempted that, to think that it was all just coincidence and, oh, man, that's kind of a bummer that Jesus happened to be born into that craziness. Matthew, in his account in particular, really emphasized that God had thought about this very, very thing going back forever, essentially. Matthew quotes just a ton of, of prophets written hundreds of years before Christ for telling about his birth. So Matthew quotes in verse 15 the prophet Hosea saying that God would, quote, call his son out of Egypt, a foreign land. In verse 18, Matthew quotes the prophet Jeremiah saying that Christ's birth at Christ's birth, they would be, quote, weeping and great mourning. And then in verse 23, Matthew references the prophet Isaiah. 
all of these prophets writing hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ, saying not only would he be born, but he would be born into just dire circumstances. Uh, This is what Christmas, the true Christmas, teaches us, that God intentionally and deliberately wrote his son into the story of our brokenness. The chaos, the messiness, the, 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 the scariness of it all, the, the brokenness wasn't, wasn't an accident. It was actually the point. And why would he do this? Well, the, the answer to that seems quite straightforward, wouldn't you say? It's to show that God meets us in our brokenness. In fact, God runs toward us in our brokenness. Uh, one of the things that's pretty remarkable is when you look at all the scripture and, and a lot of these titles that are given to Jesus, uh, they're really awe-inducing. You know, these titles of, he's the author of life. He's the sustainer of all things. It's like as we said last week, he holds the universe in his pinky. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And yet the Christmas story shows us unequivocally that he was born not just into our life, but into a poor family and into harsh brokenness. And then when he grew up to be a man, it's not like he tapped out and said, all right, I'm done with that life. Time to upgrade my living circumstance. No, page after page after page, when you read the gospel or biographical accounts of Jesus' life, he was spending time precisely in people's brokenness. It's what he came to do. The Christmas story, then, affirms what the Bible teaches over and over and over, and what... Uh, we all, I believe, humbly speaking, uh, know for ourselves at, at the deep and intuitive level, and that is that the world isn't the way it's meant to be. Brokenness is not how the world is meant to be. All the, the, the pain, the suffering, uh, boy, you could read about lots of wars right now, the collateral damage from that, but you don't even have to look too far. You just see relational Division and derision, it's just all around us. The brokenness that we see and we regularly experience is not how the world is is meant to be. One of my favorite metaphors that the scripture uses to describe the result of this is that we all inwardly groan because of this. Humankind, we groan that the world is not the way that it's supposed to be. In fact, it goes on to say that all of creation groans. Because things aren't the way it's supposed to be. And the reason the world experiences such brokenness, the Bible says, is because of our sin. Because of the the lies that we choose to live apart from God. In other words, doing things that we know we ought not to do. And not doing things we know we ought to do. Brokenness exists in the world because of our selfishness, our self-righteousness, our pride, our greed, our lust, our impatience, our fill-in-the-blank. And Because that's happening the world over and throughout all generations, the brokenness in the world is just, it's just, it's just heavy. It's brokenness all all around us. And what we see in the true Christmas story is that God meets us in that brokenness. In fact, I'll just highlight three things. We'll go super quickly here. But three things that this text has to show us about God meeting us in our brokenness. Number one, it shows us that he cares. God cares. One of the questions that people ask Christianity often is if there is a God and he is good, how is it there's pain and suffering? Well, what this text shows us, while it's not trying to answer everything that we could say about that question, it does show us what it's not, and that is that God doesn't care. God absolutely cares. In fact, it's to the opposite end that God cares so much that he runs into and to our brokenness. He cares, he loves. And then what this text also shows us is that he understands. I mean, this is one of the most mind-boggling things to me about the God we follow. It's that he he doesn't just know about our brokenness. It's that he's lived it. Meaning, when you and I cry out to him with our own brokenness, we don't cry out to somebody who goes, you know what, you just need to work that out already. You just need to turn that frown upside down. We don't reach out to somebody in our brokenness, to one who is detached or uncaring. We we reach out to somebody who, who first of all, cares, but also understands. And understands to a degree far greater than often our own brokenness is. In fact, infinitely more than our own brokenness is. He understands. And then what we also see, of course, from the Christmas story, is that in our brokenness, God came to redeem. He redeems. And that, of course, is what it is all about. God 
sent his son to this world on a rescue mission. Uh, he, came, he came to deliver us from our brokenness. Christmas ultimately was leading to Good Friday and Easter. The manger was ultimately leading to, leading to the cross and the empty tomb. And, you know, when we often wrestle with a question like, how could a good God allow pain and suffering? It seems to me that sometimes we may be missing the full extent of our brokenness. We might miss the full extent of our brokenness because our brokenness is not just external, outside of us. Our brokenness is also and actually very much intricately, intricately linked to what's happening within and on, on the inside. And, and the greatest consequence of our brokenness is not pain and suffering in the world. When we sin, the greatest consequence is not that life is now hard, which it is, terrible as that is. The greatest consequence is actually that we have been separated from our relationship with a holy, loving, and just God. And God sent his son to the world to do for us what we cannot do, living the life, sinless life, and to accomplish what we could not accomplish for ourselves, dying in our place. Uh, God the Father sent his son on a rescue mission in order to redeem us so that we could come back into a relationship with him. So that our greatest point of brokenness, being separated from, from him, could be, we could be brought back and made, and made whole in him. That's why it says to all who receive him, to all who believe on his name, he gives the right to become children of God. God cares, he understands, and he redeems. And if you're here today and you've never received him, that's, the, that's what's known as the gospel, which literally means the good news. That you can receive what he has done for you on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. So you can be brought back into a relationship by faith. You know, we love the, the tradition around Christmas of giving gifts, right? It's a wonderful tradition to give gifts and receive gifts. Uh, that isn't random, you know, that really, that tradition harkens back, of course, to the true and real meaning of Christmas when God gave us the ultimate gift in his son, right? He gave, us, he gave us a gift. And what do you do with the gift? You just go, thank you. <laughs> that's all you can do with the gift. You just, you receive it. And you say, thank you. And that's what the gospel or good news is, is God made himself available to you to be brought back into a right relationship, forever relationship with him through what his son did for you and me on the cross. And you can just receive it. Even today, it's the gospel. It's the good news. And for those of you who have received it, don't you see that the story shows us that God is not just with you, but he is with you precisely in your brokenness. In fact, the Christmas story as we had it read, if anything, shows us that God wants to do his greatest work in our greatest point of brokenness. God doesn't run from it. He's not detached. He runs to it and is with us through it. What if, God is, what if God is wanting to work in your brokenness today? What if whatever point in your life where you just you feel a sense of failure or shame or pain, you know, when you think about life choices that you regret, maybe when you think about your relationships and the way they're going, when you think about your, your career, your finances, you name it, your, your deepest longings and desires, and there's, there's pain there. What if God wants to meet you precisely there? Well, that's what the Christmas story shows us. That God often wants to do his greatest work where we are feeling, experiencing our greatest brokenness. And you can turn to him. You can lean on him. Even this, this Christmas holiday. Because he cares. He understands. And he redeems. You know, I had a little bit of an up and down relationship with the nativity scene this week. You know, I was thinking about it, and I was like, that's not, that's not fair. That's a facade, the nativity scene. It's like all the craziness was happening, and you get a little quick snapshot, and that's not the nativity scene. But then I realized after studying more fully that that's actually exactly what the nativity scene is. God meets us in the midst of our brokenness. There's brokenness all around us. But God's joy, peace, and hope meets us right there, especially there. And actually, the nativity scene is even better than that because the nativity scene is a precious taste, foretaste of what's to come. When God is going to make all things new, all brokenness will be made whole and right. And we will not be surrounded by brokenness anymore, but just only experience the wonderful things of Christmas. That is joy, love, and peace. So I hope you have a wonderful Christmas this year. 
Hope you're able to experience and have joy the extent you can. For those of you where, it's, where you have some pain and suffering that you're especially, maybe it's especially highlighted for you, you feel it especially because of the holiday. I want to especially pray for you. The Lord would meet you there, that you feel his joy, peace, and love. Because that's where he runs to, if anything. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you did nothing less but send your son into the world to be with us, and not just with us, with us in our brokenness. Thank you for the joy, hope, and peace that we, we, can, we can live in because of what Christ accomplished for us. Thank you that even when times are hard, we can, we can turn to and lean on the one who knows and understands and cares. And I want to pray especially for my brothers and sisters here today who are experiencing life's brokenness in a, in a, in a, in a heavy sense right now. Would you especially comfort them, minister to them? I pray that your spirit in a supernatural way would give them a peace that transcends all understanding. And Father, help us be a church that offers this gift of life in Christ. It's in his name we pray.